that we are dealing with. If you have any questions, just stop me and we can uh, talk about uh, what we have. Just to give you like a quick um, intro of what we are dealing with, this is here the uh, uh, sugar cane aphid and sorghum. We will be talking a little bit about aphid and uh, weevil and alfalfa. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, uh, spider mites in corn and also some of the leaf poppers in alfalfa uh, as well. So, this is here just, I don't know if this is a good picture, but this is some of the damage. Uh, here on the you know, in your right here for sugar cane aphid and sorghum, comparing to one of the good ones without much infestation just outside uh, one of the people here last year or the year before in one of our trials for sugar cane aphid. Uh, this test came to us in 2016. It was like quite heavily infesting uh, sugar cane aphid. It has like a big history. It's like mainly uh, a test for sugar, and there's a huge program for resistant varieties for, uh, for sugar cane, and then switching mostly to sorghum and switch the whole, almost the whole nation from coast to coast in just three years. We cannot do that at the but we did. Uh, and you can see here, it's like characteristic by this uh, yellowish uh, color, and we have like tips for the, uh, the legs and cornicles that start in color. Uh, many of the time, especially beginning of the season, which will come in soon to us, we are planting sorghum. Uh, there is confusion between the sugar cane aphid and two other species that we can find uh, early on in the season. The corn leaf aphid, just like sugar cane aphid, but it's a little bit darker to the uh, the head and the first two segment of the uh, thorax, and a little bit darker in terms of the cornicles and the legs. And we have also the green bug, green bug, but it's an aphid too. And it's a little bit larger, oval in shape. And I don't think you can see it here, but it has like a little bit of line on the back, on the dorsal side of the body. This is like mostly like an early season aphid. Uh, you can find them in corn, you can find them in sorghum, but they don't they didn't do much problem because they cannot stand the heat of our growing season later on. In terms of the management for uh, sugar cane aphid, for many years we found like one very important tool that we can use to mitigate the infestation of the sugar cane aphid is early planting. If you can find the right varieties that will bring you the, uh, the good production and you can plant early. And early here in our area, I'm talking about like late April and uh, late May. So that's here one of uh, our trial, and this is almost the same. What we found uh, in almost a three years uh, uh, trial is that you can find yes, you can you can find some of these two insects, the corn leaf and the green bug early in the season, and that's it. They are all just vanished after that, and you escape the most of the damage of sugar cane aphid, which occur later in the season. Mostly, most of the cases that happen around like the third week of August, in most of our area when we have our first. Station. We did some trials for like two methods of application for many chemicals, uh, the uh, foliar application and the infero injection or infero uh, seed coverage. And this is just some of the results from 2020. And it's, uh, as you can see here, we have some of these products that are working on managing and mitigating this uh, uh, population quite good. We used to have good. Um, Protection and good control was simply the couple of years before, but for like 2020, it didn't do well, and there's some inconsistency again in 2021. <coughs> in terms of the intro injection, this is an application that we did it early in the season, actually at the planting time. We have, you know, special, you know, uh, model and special boom that we are using to um, cover the area. Uh, around the soil uh, with the seeds. And with that, we do mostly like uh, this uh, injection with severity at planting time. And we have other uh, treatments here where we add some foliar applications as well. So you can see here, uh, we have uh, some treatments like Spanto only, and some other when we have the Spanto with uh, foliar application with uh, some transform. 
and then we have another one with the uh, application option. You can see, like most of the time here, the combination of this uh, enfor injection with the foliar application or even alone, we are still giving us very good protection against the uh, population of this sugar cane here. One of the things that have been always uh, said, why should we do that? Why should we like put an early application for a problem that didn't exist yet? We don't see the population of this sugar cane here. It's a bad question because you might wait until you have some of these uh, sugar cane aphid and do the foliar uh, application. However, like our experience with this insect now about five, six years, and every time we used to have higher yields in the uh, injection from an influence injection compared to um, the foliar application. And I can contribute that to you know the consistent of protection against these populations that provided by the injection. It's not registered yet. So it's not even something that we can do, but for uh, that's the difference between uh, between the two. Here. So the other uh, pest that we are uh, dealing with during the summer time in another crop is spider mites and in pool, and mainly like the two spots spider mites that most abundant in our area here. We did many trials over the years, and we have. Uh, there are few products, but they are quite you know, effective so far uh, in uh, putting this population under control, especially uh, when we have this influx in population with our heat uh, of the summer. This uh, species that we have of spider mite likes our condition quite good. A lot of dirt and a lot of heat and a little bit of humidity. That's very good conditions for them, and we have them you know, summer long. So we did some of these trials over the year when we had like, uh, again here at MAC, this is like just an image for some of the plots that we have uh, a couple of years ago. And what we have here is we have uh, a, a whole bunch of chemicals that we are using, but we are ended up in terms of like the active ingredients, three or four of these groups that we are having all the time. Mostly like uh, onager, and we have seeds, we have uh, or seed, and some of the tagging mix and tagging tag program as well. What we see like most of the years, and I might share this with you before, is that we have like a little bit of weary when it comes to the population. We have a year of very heavy infestation and then another year of less population and then a heavy one again and so on. So that's, that's what we are finding here. You can see this like yellow represents the untreated. Um, and you can see all of the year when we have the high population, uh, the product, all the products are actually quite managing this entity, except here in 2019, that was like uh, a signal, but our results so far showing that was just you know, the, the offline trend, but everything is still under control. Uh, another group of ENSIC that we are dealing with is the field, uh, I'll talk about this uh, uh, in, in, in the letter here. This is a table here that showing the major uh, insect pests in our letters. And, and you can see, like, from uh, this table and the corresponding months in from the top here, you can see we have a group of these insects that's happening during the winter, springtime, like the alfalfa weaver, and also the complex of uh, alfalfa aphids. We have four species of them. This is mostly these two groups, we will and it are winter to uh, spring time kind of pests. And then we have like the more of like a warmer season uh, insects, uh, mostly like a group of adopters, like uh, uh, worms here, and also a group of coppers, the, the sea corner of coppers and a group of uh, uh, leaf hoppers as well. For many years, we uh, uh, did some research, cover, uh, try to cover them in the morning about alpha weevil and like uh, finding their economic threshold and some of the efficacies of some of the uh, chemistry we have and so on. But we also did some work on the other pests that we would just touch it on them uh, in this very short time. One of these pests was like the leaf hoppers. We have like three of them. 
the God can be proper for people who are mixed mix can be proper. The last two are like the most destructive, and the third one is really, really bad. And uh, the mix can be proper, like mostly it is um, then around the area uh, of the Colorado River. And you cannot differentiate much in terms of like the shape between the potato mix and one. They are quite similar, and even to um, differentiate between the two, you need some kind of dissection and you need some part to. Uh, uh, to examine and distinguish between the two. So uh, we, we just can differentiate the two most of the time by the damage, the damage from resistance and by going and carry over from one side to the other. That's mostly makes it if it's not it's a particularly powerful. So most of the damage of the leaf over what we are calling the hover burning. It is like um, feeding on the set of the of the plant and leaf, you know, the tip of the leaflet like you know, like that, and then it become reddish and then it dark. And uh, some of the some some uh, or actually many times this uh, damage can carry over to the next site. I have like double fields I was following last year here close to uh, in the Gila River uh, reservation here, I was following them last year. They have high, very high population of the leaf hopper. And it happened that they couldn't cut for about four or five months during the summer after this station. The other uh, hopper that's not found by is the three corners of buffalo or like uh, camel hump hopper, uh, whatever you call it, that's in the other here. And it is not as significant in terms of the damage as the other leaf hoppers, although they can do damage when they have a uh, really high population. The damage mostly around the, um, by the feeding of this nymph. And the nymphs, like I'm here for over like 11 years now, I believe it's not going to be like a thousand nymphs all of this time because they feed mostly on the area near the ground. And it's very hard to get them unless you are like when you and the knees are like swimming very hard to receive to sweep them to collect them. So it's not easy to collect this nymph, but it is the one that's making most of the damage. And the damage here mostly like a grid of stems with purple color. It's very unique and you cannot miss it. That's especially when you have really high population. This uh, hopper also is very uh, recognized by its migration, migrate a lot. And you can like spray the area, you can get good control, and then a week later you have a huge population of them coming from somewhere else. We did some, you know, uh, trials here at MAP. We used different uh, uh, products here, as you can see. And this product had, you know, different uh, emphasis on these two groups of focus. If you look at the um, the first one here, this is on not only potato leaf, I should say, but I, I only put it to potato uh, leaf hoppers here because that's what we found mostly in our area at the station. But we can see also some of the others, especially the garden leaf hopper. But overall, if you look at the, the product, you can see like the base right Excel is like doing uh, good in terms of the management of this, uh, of this uh, insect. Compared to the other group of insecticides, they are all like in the middle here, but all of them are significant than the share. So that's for like the um, the leaf hopper. For the three corner hopper, we have better luck because you have many products that are still working on it, like Face Royal, Excel, Cement, still working, Warrior, uh, uh, a mix of Warrior and Malatia, and Eagle. They are still working on this three order. And for, for some of our uh, growers, we are using this as like a cleanup for some of these high population species that's coming later on in the summer. Uh, in our and that's the yield here. And it's like it was very corresponding with what we can see in terms of reduction in the population here compared to, uh, to the other. This is one of the picture that I use a lot. It's from Jason Ruby and in Buckeye area. I don't know if you can see it, but you can see in this area exactly here. 
This is a yellowish area, pale area, and this one up here compared to the rest of the field in the middle. That's when he decided to shut off the nozzle. So he want to see if there would be any impact for the base rod that he was using. And then, and in fact, they had shown again the yield for this area. One of the other insects that we are dealing with also is aphids. And as I said, we have like a, a, a complex of two of these aphid species, four of them uh, in our deserts. The uh, key aphid, two are all aphid, calcium aphid, and spot calcium aphid. The first two are like the most abandoned and they are quite similar. They are greenish in color. Some say like key aphid, that's a little bit bigger, but when you are comparing like them to others, it's very hard to say which. which. But the most distinguished thing between the two is the antenna. The TA we did have this like novel or like tips or whatever you call them. It's not there in the blue of the TA. When I first started here, there was like you can pick a stem and you can like you have to search for like some of these aphids here. Like you can see some here, one there, one on the beach, you see it here. But all of a sudden, after 2012, you can go out in the field and with like only five speed, you can predict with much of this aphid here. Most of them are P aphid and blue and pulp aphid. The problem with blue and pulp aphid, it is more uh, destructive because, because it can inject some of these toxins inside the stem and it can retard the growth of the pulp of like that. We did some work on uh, the aphid threshold, and if, if you look at many of the of this population, especially when you have like a sharp line like this, you can see like a little bit of, you look at the middle area here, you can see like there's some differentiation of uh, a range between 40 to 80 uh, aphids. Uh, and that's mainly close to what the commander now is about, like you have the average of 50 aphids per stand. If you also look at this like relationship over the years between the number of aphids per stem on the x axis and the yield of the y axis. You can see there is some yield where you have really sharper relationship between the two, which means the higher population of this aphid you have, the more loss you have in terms of the yield. While in some other years, you have like more of like a flattened one, which is like saying there is not much relationship between them. What we found over the year is. The more of this blue alpha aphid, the more that you have these problems. And this problem could be worsened in terms of some of these years when you have more drier conditions. So, this combination of more P, blue alpha aphid, and drier condition is making things worse, especially uh, uh, if you have a high abundance of high population of But there is some you know, good news for like the uh, alfalfa aphid in general. Uh, like, since 2015, we started to see some natural infection of some entomopathogenic fungi in the area here. And this is quite phenomenal. We are still like in the little, right? But during the morning, especially like when it's not that hot and trying to walk in alfalfa field, you will have your food, you know, a little bit wet, and that's some kind of a microenvironment. Of the canary that where some of these spores of these entomopathogenic fungus can, can work. This is here some of these infected uh, aphids. This is all locally imported from different fields in our area. And it is brownish in color. This is mostly, I think, all of them except maybe this one, they are all blue and alpha aphids. And they are infected with this entomopathogenic fungus natural. And the first field I identified. I heard about this infection in it was like when Lord Stewart down in Yellow um, Bend area. And I think he didn't spray for him for many years since 2015 because of this kind of uh, uh, natural infection. We have like one grad student, uh, uh, Rebecca House. She, does, she just finished a couple of months ago and she did some lab work on one of these commercial formula of. Uh, one of the entomopathogenic fungus we found in Nigeria species. And she did like two kinds of setup. One was a direct spray, when she used like one of these uh, paintbrush spray to 
uh, uh, spray like a cup of uh, plastic cup with a little bit of cigar in the bottom, and she sprayed the air directly, and then she moved them into a fresh cigar cup of uh, one. And then we have the indirect one, when she just sprayed, you know, a well in this tray here, and then she added a, a piece of alpha stem and then exposed the apron to this alpha stem. She did that with two uh, commercial formula of two thermoacidic uh, fungi. One is the Iberia, and the other one is the famous Bovaria. Uh, this is here the results that she found, and on the top here, you have the indirect, uh, I'm sorry, to, to your left here, you will have the direct uh, application with the two uh, fungus, Isaria and Uveria, and on the right here, the indirect for Isaria and Uveria. You can see like with the direct application of Isaria, you reach a uh, uh, percentage mortality close to 60%. For the Uveria, it's a little bit close to 38, 39% at thermal mortality. The indirect, the mortality went down for Isaria for about two, only about 20%, and for Moveria, a little bit with 20%. That's for like most of the lab. This is all in the lab, right? We did some work on in the, uh, the field as well here at Maricopa, where we have, you know, many of these. Uh, insecticide that we are using, and we added like two uh, formula of these two fungus, the Bovaria. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, it's the Bovaria, the Diana, it's my formula botanical. And as you can see here, this part represents the aphid population, and this green line here represents the yield. If you look at like this bar here that represents the uh, Bovaria. You can see we have very high population of aphid, and the yield here is quite low. It's almost comparable to the untreated check. So it doesn't work in the field, although it was working uh, uh, in the lab. If you look at the other formula here, this is the PFR. This is the Isaria, the commercial formula of the other thermobacogenic fungus, Isaria. And you can see here yeah, we are still having a higher population of aphid. But if you look at the yield, the yield is quite high, it's even comparable to the best that's produced from one of the most effective insecticide here. And we can see that in the lab, when we bring this data population in the lab and we just read them, especially in this treatment, you can see that if you leave, like, leave them in the bag for about a couple of hours, they will start turning brown from the green to brown, meaning that the spores is here and they are starting. Uh, to initiate and starting to grow and propagate. In the field, these spores, when they are starting to grow, they will prevent the insect from feeding. So, although you can collect them, although you can see them, they are still infected and they cannot feed on the uh, alfalfa. That's why that's appeared in the yield here with the field in this yield. We have this trial again in, in another year, but it was like very human and uh, we have a little bit of higher population too, but still, you can see this here the uh, Isaria species, uh, or like the Isaria fungus here, and this is the yield. Still, the yield here was com compared to the um, the other yield, it was significant, highly significant, but still not as significant as some of the other insecticides. But again, the condition here was working again in this. Uh, uh, fungus formula because of the drier condition and the higher population of blue here. So, another thing that I would like to share with you is about some of this. You know, we are talking a lot about chemical yields that we are using to manage this enzyme. So, we have some problem with some of the active ingredients for some, uh, not only for uh, alfalfa, but also especially for alfalfa uh, weaver. We, we only maybe like half, maybe like three main active ingredients or groups, pyrosporids, like the intoxicarb and the organophosphate. We might have like some sclerosis that some of are using in organic setup. And we have very rare group of, of the type that uh, some again use in the organic. But 
We are losing the gap of state where we know that those stand gap. Their labor is not doing anymore. That's technically leaving us to only two groups Pyrostroid and Star. That said, the other two groups that I'm just putting here, they are not used in our system. Saying that, and having this problem, we have a lot of reports about some resistance of some virus, which means we are only like with one group. Even in my trial, I can tell you, like we used to start with only 6.4 amps per kilo per steward. Now I have to push it all the way to 10 to get the same kind of test. So with that again, the signs of the system. That's why we are waiting for your project. So saying that we, we, we have some 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 problem and show it here. This is a little bit of business uh graph that I shared with you. This is some of our work of monitoring the uh, resistance in our Papa Weaver. We collect population from different states, from Arizona, for sure, from California, from Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Utah, and uh, other years we collected from Oregon and some other states as well. But you, you can see, like, this is the system monitoring for one of the biosoids for Warrior uh, 2 or the Celestial uh, Lambda or Lambda Celestial. You can see, like, for this location here, you can see uh, most of these bars are reaching the top, which means they can provide 100% mortality or close to it. Most of these locations are in Arizona, as you can see here, which means most of our areas are still good in terms of using the water, except some exception, some uh, areas that are wanted. But if you look at some other area, like Eureka here in Northern California, you can see you can barely like make it like 50% for mortality here for some of these, uh, some, some of these things. Some areas in Texas showing even the same trend. Even like some area like twice just across the border from us, we have this strain. So we are not far from that. And we need to know from you uh, what you are using when you are having such problems or having this problem here. So um, Alphamir is here, he is our Arizona uh, Pest Management Manager. He has some survey about some uh, Cobari Force alternative use, which is like Loves that uh, alternative use. So, yes, you have another survey. And if you have like your phone and you just can take it, uh, a scanning of this QR code, you will go directly to the survey. It will not take you much. It should be like very few questions. Do you see your phone? Something like that? Yeah, uh, only one. You say you didn't use for yeah. the last mile. How did you not? You know, not. Challenge too because most of the time we are asking you to, you know, recycle the different uh, active ingredient to avoid some kind of resistance. We don't have that luxury here. So um, we'll see how it's going, out, how much it can hold on the stewardship of this carrier. Okay. Any question for me? Right. Yeah, what's the threshold for treating hoppers? For the hoppers? Yeah. Well, it that the threshold that in the publication for, for the three corner one for the, the leaf hopper. For the leaf hopper, you can go up to like 25 to 30. But in many of our cases, and this is my uh, like recommendation over the years, you should like let them go over 20. So yeah. 20, 20 percent, that's, that's, you know, you have to go because the problem with us also is the um, movement of these. And, once you have them in the field, they will bring or like they will produce some views for others to come. And in no time, you will have like a representation of the population that comes from somewhere else. Whether it's like a neighborhood that just cut or like some area in the desert where it becomes like dissipated and you are just moving to the nearest degree area. Yeah, last year actually not real low number. Yeah. Still lost control. Yeah. 
that, that's one of the things that, again, one of the pressure that looks that whatever number we are having, it's not like, it doesn't have a solid uh, research behind. For us just to get this threshold for a month or even we did our work for how many years, five years. So it, it takes a lot of time to just get this kind of relationship between the two Other questions? Okay, guys, thank you so much for coming today. And thank you for holding that long. And uh, the lunch is back there. Thank you for the Gita and FMC for like sponsoring us today. And don't forget if you are planning to see you today, to have your name and your license number on the uh, site. Okay. Any any last announcement, Jane? Yes, I wrote some of these tentative uh, schedules up on that. Go back in person. Phoenix is in August. We're just going to do the mornings for four mornings. We have the, or Tuesday, 